Now, this kind of perpetuating hustle and bustle on Facebook or whatever about these videos, governed by gossip and popularity rather than scientific evidence, um, is highly comparable to how medieval society worshipped their saints over a thousand years ago. And so to compare this, we go back to 1300 to a certain man named Hugh Le Barber, conveniently named through his vocation as the barber to St. Thomas of Cantaloupe during his later years. Um, this is taking place at Hereford. He began to develop an eye condition which was increasingly uh, making him blind. And in order to find a solution to his ailment, he undertook pilgrimage to the shrine of his deceased former bishop and appealed to be given a miracle. So alongside this pilgrimage, Hugh also commissioned and donates two wax eyes made to the exact same measurements of his own. Following this act, um, his eyesight was restored by the saint. And this comes from us from a testament um, made to a papal investigation into the shrine in 1307. And it's the results of this investigation that this conference paper arises from, really, because Hugh's acts of donating the wax symbol is not unique. And the papal investigation shows that over 1,424 wax limbs and bodily organs had been donated to the shrine which, according to those who maintain the shrine, was a mere fraction of the overall amount that had been reused, sold or deteriorated since. Nevertheless, the overwhelming number of wax images is no mere coincidence. Hugh places his faith and devotion into this tradition of worship because he believed that it would work, as did many others. But the question is, why did he think this? And how did these traditions become so widespread? Now, our greatest insight and source into worshipping traditions is the late 12th century miracula of Thomas Becket, written by Benedict of Peterborough, who describes a wide array of donation traditions. He writes, for instance, that he witnesses pilgrims bending coins over ill people to invoke the saint's aid, or commissioning candles to the measurements of the ill person's body to heal them. Yet another more controversial practice involved a cluster of stories regarding Canterbury water, a little different from those mixing chia seeds and lemon juice nowadays, because this cocktail mixture was um, one part water and one part the blood of Thomas Beckett, which one would drink in hopes of healing their ailments. Now, drinking water that had come into contact with the saint is kind of a time-honored tradition. We see it in many cases around different shrines that this is something that happens. However, the idea of drinking blood is a whole other ballgame. Benedict writes that the monks at Canterbury were very fearful of endorsing the idea. And he says that, and with no wonder, for it was an unusual thing to, for people to drink human blood. Furthermore, uh, more than being disgusting, uh, Benedict contemplated the right to do such a thing as it conflicted and mirrored the Eucharist ritual. Later, this practice would actually be the shrine's downfall, as promoting Beckett as the Lamb of Canterbury alongside drinking his blood provided Tudor critics with the ammunition needed to destroy the shrine. Nevertheless, at the close of the Vita, uh, William Fitz Stevens details a story whereby a man at Canterbury who had acquired the cloth stained um, clothes, um, the blood stained clothes of Beckett, um, dipped it into water and made his paralyzed wife drink it. Miraculously, she was cured. It is believed that this is where the tradition arose and others attempted to drink the blood um, to kind of imitate this and also reap the rewards. And what is so interesting, I guess, is that more miracles arose because of this. So much so that the monks actually began to support this practice. Benedict, who had previously said that it was almost heretical and disgusting to drink the blood, is now saying that this was not begun without great fear, but seeing that it gave profit to the ill, our fear receded little by little and security came. We even see Benedict declare, O oh, marvellous water that not only quenches the thirst of drinkers, but also extinguishes pain. O oh, marvellous water that not only extinguishes pain, but also reduces swellings. Clearly changing his mind about um, the same practice he had once called disgusting and unholy. But the main point of this story is, is something quite interesting. 
and that's that this form of worship was being undertaken before formal institutional endorsement or promotion by the church. And therefore, when we understand worshipping traditions, we must look at them with the understanding that they are not governed by ecclesiastical lay laws, but rather products of popular gossip or oral tradition, in the same way that we may see nowadays videos online and try to copy them because we see that it works and so we want to do the same. Proof of this is shown by individual worshipping practices that didn't make it into the mainstream pilgrim culture. One such example arose from the early days of Beckett's cult, whereby a man from Exeter had a vision in which he was told to, that to cure an outbreak of disease, he must boil an egg, cut it into quarters, write Thomas's name on each quarter, and then eat it. Another example of a London priest named Roger tried to cure his fever by sleeping in a place he heard Thomas Beckett had once slept. He awoke the next morning healed and had the idea to collect some of the dust and mix it with water to drink. According to him, it gave happiness to many ill people. But nevertheless, both of these um, examples, safe to say, although inventive, were never referenced again and quickly dropped off because they just weren't popular enough and weren't successful enough to get into that mainstream pilgrim culture. As such, conversational popularity is key to understanding this topic, understanding individual and collective worship in this period. And whilst practices like donating wax limbs were highly popular, others like eating a boiled egg dropped off almost immediately. And as said before, this format is comparable to modern day trends where some gain virality whilst others don't. But it all are based on social gossip and the belief in some degree of truth, validity or success behind the trend. And that final point is key. As the popularity of such worshipping traditions is dependent upon their success. If you had heard on the grapevine along bustling pilgrim roads that a certain form of worship was becoming popular and was successful, then in a time of desperation, you'd probably give it a go. Um, especially if the story you heard was similar to your own. And it is one of these, is for this reason why many miraculars across uh, English shrines had similar patterns of problems and worshiping traditions. Anyone who has read a, mir uh, a miracular will know of the copious amounts of men lost at sea asking to be saved or pilgrims with blindness and paralysis seeking to be cured in very similar ways. Nevertheless, returning once more to our um, papal investigation, alongside the wax limbs were also 97 nightgowns and 108 crutches. These are symbolic items which represent the miracle sought or obtained. Nightgowns, for example, mentioned in the investigation were almost probably donated by women who were formerly infertile and who had been granted a child. Likewise, crutches were donated by pilgrims with former physical disabilities. disabilities. Wax limbs, however, far outnumbered any other form of donation, and it is not too unique to Hereford either, as another list, one dedicated to just wax limbs, at um, York Minster shows that examples of whole bodies, heads, hands, arms, legs, feet, teeth, hearts, breasts, eyes, even ships and animals, all in wax, were donated to the shrine of Richard Scrope. Miracle collections across the country also detail stories of people donating moulded wax limbs. Two examples from Norwich alone include a certain man who donated wax boots to heal his swollen feet, and a wax breast left by a woman to heal her cancer. But what is particularly interesting and notable about these traditions is that practices like these not only transcend religious and secular law, but they also rise above social class. Now we tend to throw around the notion of a pilgrim without necessarily truly understanding the extent to which this is a grand umbrella term for those who sought to walk the path the holy path. The truth of the matter is, is that there are vast numbers of reasons why someone may undertake a pilgrimage, and there are much, uh, a much greater amount of people visiting shrines across the country. Ronald Finucane has undertaken prolific work on the miracles of some of the most important shrines, including Thomas Beckett, William of Norwich, and Thomas of Cantaloupe. 
You see, miracle collections can be used to represent a sample size of the wider pilgrim community and thus allow us to decode, amongst other things, the social class of said pilgrims. And through the analysis of over 1,900 miracles, Finucane gathered some highly insightful figures that allow us to understand the extent to which pilgrimage does not segregate social class. In general, he found that 61% of English pilgrims were male, with 39% being female. 86% of all miracles analyzed came from the lower classes, such as peasants, yet within the male sex, only 56 came percent came from their social class. Instead, most male pilgrims were of the ecclesiastical background, lower clergy such as priests and monks, as well as upper ecclesiasts, which consisted of bishops and members of the clergy. Now, Finucane also um, conducted a comparison with pilgrims from northern France and found that whilst there were equal proportion of sexes, English pilgrims were typically a higher social class than French pilgrims. A great example of one such shrine can be, that can be used as a microcosm of social class is that of Bury St Edmunds. Because of the recorded pilgrims, we can see that both male and female visitors, there is a notable amount of nobility, knights and upper ecclesiasts. And Edmund's Miracular provides many examples of peasants, gentry, knights, aristocracy and nobility all seeking similar forms of protection and participating within similar worshipping rituals. When King uh, Ethelred abandoned the regions of England, allowing the wealth of the region to be taxed by Swain, According to the Miracular, written by Archdeacon Herman, the saint became a focus for resistance and protection amongst local peasants who sought out the saint to help cease the tribute. Likewise, local landowners sought out the shrine in order to plea for protection against extortion. And of course, we also see Henry I and King John undertake pilgrimage to Bury St Edmunds in order to seek protection. Once again, demonstrating a commonality in social class and worship. And whilst Hugh Le Barber at Hereford invoked the spirit of the saint through donating wax eyes, Edward I also employed the same tradition at the shrine of St Thomas Becket, whereby he donated two wax falcons in order to cure his own. Another example is Henry, Duke of Lancaster, who willed that at his funeral um, there should be nothing extravagant or vain other than five candles made to the weight of his body. Likewise, Henry III also spent over £51 for 15 candles measured to his size to be donated at the shrine of Edward Confessor. Now, this was a particularly popular commission, whereby a pilgrim would order a candle made to his measurement in length and width. Whilst unlikely that this was literal, having a you know, six foot two candle. Uh, one example recorded in the Miracular of St. William of Norwich shows a farmer surrounding his herd of sick oxen with a thread which was then folded up and turned into a candle to be offered at the shrine to cure them. To fold the wick was a common practice and we witness examples of candles offered at shrines which with wicks folded up to 60 times. The extremity of such practice is evident by the annual donation of a taper wound around a drum, which was donated at the shrine of Thomas Becket by the city of Dover. Now, this doesn't sound too extreme until we understand that the length of the taper was that of the entire circumference of the city. Yet monetary donations also demonstrate how worshipping traditions transcend social class. Whilst it may be assumed that half a penny from a pauper was more pious than a shilling from a rich man, evidence suggests that monetary offerings were separate from personal income and social position. Instead, a symbolic gesture described in many miracle stories shows pilgrims donating a single coin before departing home from the shrine. Variations of this tradition include bending a coin or wearing it as a necklace to symbolize a sealed vow of pilgrimage. Nevertheless, whatever the coin may have been, the act of placing it on top of the altar is a practice undertaken by peasants and kings alike. We have records of Henry VI 
offering um, each day at his chapel a special gold talent equivalent to five nobles in weight, which was placed on top of the altar. altar. Likewise, Henry III sent gold coins to be fixed atop of Becket's shrine and the shrine of Edward the Confessor. And Edward I in 1300 also placed a gold florin at the shrine of, uh, at the altar of Canterbury for the fetus then um, existing in the queen's belly. At Lincoln Cathedral, the keeper of the shrine had in his possession a certain gold noble fixed to the head of St. Hugh by Richard III, King of England. Now, much work has been done on economic fluctuations and, and inflation to also show that the rise and fall of wages and income for peasants, gentry and kings alike, has little effect on the monetary donations at shrines. The evidence suggests that there is no obvious correlation between offerings and the changes in price and wages. Major shifts in both sometimes, does occur, uh, sometimes occurred at the same time, but nevertheless, um, not in the direction that you would expect. Any correlation is probably the result of other forces acting upon both, rather than a simple case of cause and effect. Shrine proceeds were not solely economic. Although the favour of saints was in some ways a service purchased with offerings, it was not subject to the usual market forces. The law of supply and demand, for example, apply where there is theoretically no limit to the supply of divine favour. Saints in heaven play, plainly had no need for cash income, and therefore the faith and devotion of the act of offering itself showed probably counted for more than its monetary value. And I have found no evidence to suggest that the clergy, clergy responsible for shrines overtly tried to increase pilgrim spending or relate the quality of the saint's aid to the amount of money spent. Commercialization commonly occurs uh, in the form of souvenirs, indulgences or handling relics. Obviously, some pilgrims, certainly the richer individuals, offered a great deal more than one penny. But for most, even one penny sterling in England's relatively undebased currency must have been a significant unit of wealth. And the majority of pilgrims are therefore likely to have offered one coin each, regardless of wage rates or prices, with the poorest perhaps offering a half penny or a farthing rather than a full penny. Wage rates are also applicable only to wage earners, which does not account for non-waged peasantry or nobility. Thus, it can be said with reasonable confidence that monetary factors like inflation and wages were at best a secondary influence on the level of shrine offerings. Rather, the evidence shows that instead, that it is a demonstration of an underlying worshipping culture within pilgrimage that vast amounts of people partook in. And so to draw it all together, clearly there is a worshipping culture throughout England that is not governed by law but rather oral tradition, gossip and popularity. And we see this in both monetary and non-monetary traditions, from donating wax limbs to a single coin. Evidence also shows that people from varying social backgrounds sought to participate in these practices. And whilst shrine offerings demonstrate that the actions of the pilgrim, whether a king or a peasant, all contained the same aspirations and expectations, the only difference is the personal and individual scale or style of the physical offering, as we see, like donating a wax eye compared to two falcons or a taper around the whole city. But what's important is in, this, in, in such a hierarchical world, it is almost poetic then to consider that faith and worship on an individual and collective scale could transcend class, politics, and national borders. Thank you.